housing prices in the Netherlands uh, are going through the roof, like you say. Um, you take away from people the prospect of owning a house uh, which you can finance with a decent job and then you can start a family. And it's, it's often being called a social contract. Peter Omtzigt, a very good uh, politician, he calls it like that. There should be a relation between the state and the people and if you be behave, if you're productive and you're nice and you're not too criminal, you work hard. Uh, you deserve a nice house uh, somewhere. You take that from people. And in Greece you say, okay, I will take from you the opportunity to ever work. Hmm. Uh, so they're bo in both countries, the youth are suffering in different ways, but in an unsustainable way. Welcome to the Gold Republic Podcast. My name is Bart Brandt. And I'm Alexei Jordanov. In our weekly podcast, we invite guests from all over the world to get valuable insights into the emergence of a new monetary system through the lens of precious metals, cryptocurrencies, and other financial instruments. Welcome to a new episode of the Gold Republic podcast. Today, our guest, a recurring guest, uh, by popular demand, I may say, Arno Vellens. Arno is a financial journalist. He's also a banking specialist. Arno, you've uh, visited the Gold Republic podcast studio before. So yes. thank you for coming again. It's, it's my second home right now. Oh, wow. That's a great compliment. Arno, Today, a couple articles about housing came out. Housing is uh, um, on fire. Mm -hmm. And might this be a symptom? It, it is a symptom. I mean, a sympt uh, wait a minute, the symptom of what? What we discussed uh, previous previously? Yeah, we've... Uh, we've uh, in the past interview, yeah. Yes, in the past interview, you've uh, been our guest before. And we were talking about the the unbalances of uh, the European Union. We've seen this and we touched upon housing in that interview. Um, housing is going through the roof. Yes, not in a nice way, you might say. Looks nice if, if, you, if you own real estate and you see the book value of your uh, property going up. Um, those pe people that en enjoy that situation, they should reflect on the fact that if they were ever to move, um, other properties have gone up as well. So if you live in Rotterdam and you see that the, the value of your house has doubled, and you want to move to Amsterdam or The Hague, there you will buy a property that has also doubled. That's, the whole, that, that's a prisoner's dilemma in, in it. People think that they are special, but everybody um, has to deal with the same facts. And if you move, you will have to get a new mortgage based on the, on the, on the values that have, been, that have doubled. And it will be very hard for you to get a mortgage in the first place. So in the short run, one might say, okay, that's good. Let's celebrate. Um, but in the long run, nobody really benefits, as, as, uh, apart from speculators, of course. But most ordinary people don't. And society as a whole is being damaged by it. Yeah, and we see governments... Uh, well, first of all, I want to talk about the inflation numbers. Mm -hmm. Inflation is, uh, is rising. Um, well, we've seen above expected inflation, actually. And, and would you also call that one of these, uh, these symptoms or indicators? Um, yes, Ob obviously. Um, while remarking that I think that housing prices should be um, in, the, in the official number as well. And it is quite weird that the largest uh, cash outlay in your life which is your house, um, is not in the so-called basket. So the central banks, they, they, when they calculate inflation, um, and that calculation uh, is, use, is used to base their policy on, Ooh, inflation is a little bit low, let's fire it up a little, they ignore housing prices. And if you were to do that, you would get a completely different situation. Then the central banks would say, wait a minute, people can't afford... Uh, their ordinary lives anymore. They, they, they can't. The standards of living are actually dropping. If you look, if you incorporate housing prices in it, and then they would stop doing what they're doing. The CPI numbers changed, in, or the way we calculate inflation has changed in, in 1980. I, I think you know John Williams of ShadowStats.com. Mm -hmm. And um, why why would these inflation numbers be calculated differently? Well. Um, at least speaking from uh, from Europe or the Europe European Union or the, the Netherlands. The problem is, um, I've read a lot about it. Uh, one of my fav favorite writers is Dambisa Moyo. She's an economist from Zambia. So let's have somebody um, 
with, with a different perspective. She used to work at Goldman Sachs, so she's really smart. Um, and she mentions the, the great decline, and it is the, the great generation, as she calls it. Those were the people that stormed the beaches in France and um, the resistance in France and in Europe against the Nazis. They defeated the Nazis, and then they went back to their factories, and they started having a lot of babies. And these people are the so-called great generation. And then the same happened in Germany. It has Wirtschaftswunder. Um, what people overlooked is that the growth that you'll have at that point in time will have to be reversed at a later point in time. When you have a baby boom, at a certain point in time, all those boomer babies will retire, and then you get the opposite effect. And all our economic systems, the way we measure inflation, risk in the banking sector, etc., it is all based on eternal growth. As if your economy, the factors of production, as if they would be uh, eternally growing. And mathematically, that's impossible. Um, and now, you, now you're seeing the downside of governments uh, always having policies based on eternal growth. And there's also the way you risk, uh, uh, measure risk in banks, for example. Banks are not uh, um, built to deal with uh, declining housing prices, for example. So that, that's all behind it. So in, the, in, in 1983, the Federal Reserve Bank, they um, recalibrated the way they measured inflation. They left out housing prices because they said, well, if you buy a house, it will go up anyway. So it is not a, it's not really consumption. I mean, you, you put money into your house. House may be really expensive, but it, it will go up anyway. So when you sell it, you get all your money back, so it is not consumption. That's why they left it out. Then the ECB was uh, born with the Maastricht Treaty, and the, the European Central Bank uh, measures inflation in the same way, because they simply cop uh, copied the Fed. But a lot of countries in Europe, it is not just Greece, it's also Italy, Spain, Portugal, uh, and eventually the Netherlands and Germany, they are actually in decline. Um, and we ignore that situation. We, so th the way we measure um, economic statistics um, um, has nothing to do with reality, actually. It's based on infinite growth. Infinite growth. And Well, actually, there was an article today in the Financial Daily that says if it is still wise to leave out housing numbers out of the inflation calculation. And of course, we touched upon this the last time. If we were to measure housing in the inflation numbers, then what would happen and what would, how would that contradict our, the policies of the, well, of, of fiscal policies of, of, for example, the Netherlands, but also the ECB wider? Well, if, if you were to do that, you would have an inflation that is way beyond 2%, let's say 5%. But then the ECB would have to do the opposite of what they're doing right now. And now it becomes interesting. Um, we've discussed the, the, the Bonti last time. By the way, where's the sugar? Um, the sugar. Here, here's a cookie. That, that's, that's the cookie. So we, we mentioned it. So you're ABN Amro. Here's a cookie. I'm a central give bank. I give you money. You give me mm -hmm. the cookie. You give me the cookie. I give you the cookie. Exactly. And I buy this cookie for one million. Mm -hmm. In return, you get one million in cash. And now you have one million to... To spend. To, to, to spend, or not really to spend, to give out to banks. Or to, not, not to banks, to, 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 to uh, non-financial corporations. So instead of a loan, you now have cash on your balance sheet and you can help small businesses to grow. So that's actually the shift where basically the money shifts from the banking sector into the real economy. To the real economy. And, and only through that mechanism can the economy really grow. So if central banks and banks keep uh, uh, throwing the money back and forth, nothing will happen. Real businesses will not get a new loan. They will not make real investments in the real economy. They will not hire more people. And then in, um, and unemployment won't drop. It's, it, it's, it's very obvious. And it, it's, the central bank is very clear about it. If you just look at... You, you go to Google, you say, okay, ECB, what's the goal of quantitative easing? Then they say, well, that's a trick. We hand out liquidity to banks, local banks in local economies, and they have to do the actual lending to... Um, people that want to grow, businesses that want to grow. Um, at the moment, when you accept that inflation is actually way too high, which it is, then you would have to do the opposite. And then I would have to, as a central bank, I would have to go to you, ABN AMRO, and I would say, will you buy this cookie for 1 million euro? Mm. Which you obviously will refuse <laughs> because you sold me 
uh, obviously your your nastiest cookies, your, your your filthiest cookies. So then you would have to reverse this policy of the European Central Bank. And so, and you have, to, you have to make you have to uh, make interest rates rise, for example, and mm-hmm. you have to fight inflation. Mm-hmm. And then, and then the, the central bank, from one moment to another, they would have to do the exact opposite of what they're doing right now. So I, I don't think that's <laughs> a recalibration of, of of the way inflation is measured is is upon us uh, anytime soon. So we had an analogy before. You said that the cookie full of sugar, the bounty full of sugar, is basically the symbolic of those um, well. Um, repurchasing programs, also like one form of actually quantitative easing, mm-hmm. buying those rotten assets, non-performing loans, that results in consequences, right? There's, um, if you eat too much sugar, there might be risk that you uh, develop diabetes. That's yeah. what we talked you about. You get a heart attack or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Really bad for you, sugar. Gets addictive as well. You're addicted just like a junkie. Mm-hmm. And um, this is the current environment we are in. What are the consequences of this type of behavior? Um, what you see is... Um, well, because of Corona, most people don't remember it anymore. But we've also had a repo market crisis in late 2019. And then you see what happens when your entire economy is uh, addicted to sugar. Um, and in, in September 2019, the central bank in, the, in America, the Fed, um, they started slowing down quantitative easing. Not even reversing it, not even stopping, just slowing it down a little bit. So uh, they were increasing their own balance sheet, uh, but by a little bit less, a little bit less more. And then, and because they assumed that there was so much liquidity within the system that big banks, Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, whatever, uh, J.P. Morgan, that they could uh, step up and fill the fill the uh, do the work of the central bank. And the moment when they did that, so they took a little step back. Um, then there was a crisis of confidence. A taper tantrum. You have to explain that. Oh well, d- d- reversing the 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 uh, taper. I, I don't know that word. I, I'm trying to look uh, really ta- smart here, but it's a complex word for oh. a simple process. Yeah, tapering down the liquidity. Taper, okay. so yeah, exactly. That that's what I did, and there was catastrophe catastrophe all over. Um, also in Europe, then the central banks and the ministers of finance they met and they said, well, you know what, um, the European Central Bank will not do the same as they did in in the United States. So we'll keep on printing, but we can't keep uh, keep on printing forever. Uh, so there was a big Eurogroup meeting, as they call it. It's the, the assembly of the ministers of finance of countries that actually have the euro. They met in Brussels and they said, well, you know what? We have to build euro bonds. And it was December 4th, 2019. And they also decided, and it's simply on the website of the Eurogroup, they said, well, we need to have euro bonds um, Basically, a, a common financing scheme for for the as a backstop to the to the um, single resolution board, which is built for uh, in case a bank goes bankrupt in the eurozone. They were preparing for it, and they said we have to we need those euro bonds by the summer of 2020. And well, thanks to Corona, they they had they had their excuse, uh, but the sense of urgency was already there in late uh, 2019. And they were already starting to slow down, just see what happens. And then, then uh, to, to use your analogy, then they found out that society and banking system, they're really, really addicted to sugar. They need to get a fix of sugar every day uh, with all these ramifications, all these consequences uh, at the side. But they, they didn't slow down. They had to go through with it. Then we had the corona pandemic. So they, did a, they gave us a little bit more sugar. Um, um, without any real effect to the economy, mm-hmm. that, that's 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 the ugly part because this 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 weapon has been blunted. It's like a blunted knife. You've used it too often. I've given you too much sugar. So when I take the sugar away from you, you will start to cry like a baby. But I give you if I give you some more, it it will not make you feel any happier because um, your senses have been blunted. Mm-hmm. So when the ECB started printing money as a result of Corona. S- several banks like Deutsche Bank were able to offload some of their uh, crap, their crappy loans, um, the sour cookies. Uh, but it did nothing really for the real economy. And that's the ugly part. And that's, yeah. Would you then say that because we were talking about symptoms just um, in, the, in the beginning, so housing markets totally out of whack? Mm-hmm. Um, money, money has to go somewhere. Yes, inflation soaring 
and and all of so all of these these really oh, well actually it's they're not and they're not fun and no. well if you own a house it's it might feel like fun uh, yep. but it's not fun until you start to move exactly and so it's a, it's all symptoms of a disease and the disease is too much credit too much credit and which is made possible by fiscal monetary policy for uh, firstly of course monetary policy yes. and and so what what is the goal of this monetary policy um Well, if you look at the ECB, the ECB was created to save the euro, or, or at least to safeguard stability stability within the eurozone. Um, based on the idea that there's institutions that would be doing their job as well, but those institutions were lacking. And we've mentioned that, uh, I think, last time, that the ECB is, or the, the, the eurozone is like a car without uh, brakes and the steering wheel, and it's missing two or three uh, uh, tires. And they said, okay, you know what, we'll still go ahead and we'll see what happens. If a crisis hits us, we'll, hits us, we'll, uh, we'll figure something out. For example, if you look at the discussion of the annual report of the European Central Bank in the European Parliament in 2011, they literally say that this is what happened. They said, well, the founders of the euro um, uh, started a euro with gaps, with institutional holes. Maybe they did it deliberately so that when a crisis would hit us, uh, we would feel the need and be urged to actually fill those gaps and complete the fiscal and complete the, the, the monetary union. But that didn't happen. That's the whole problem. Um, so that, that's why we have a new crisis, while, while, uh, while we'll still need to get rid of the crap that we have from the old crisis. And so, so basically, they deliberately did it. And. Um, And those gaps started uh, were the cause of the euro crisis in the first place, of course. So when uh, when the um, when the debt to GDP ratio in Greece and Italy and other countries when it started to escalate, there was nobody to keep them in check and keep the banks in check. Uh, you can always be angry with certain people in certain countries like Greece and Italy and their respective governments, but it is our banks, it is the Northern European banks, uh, they feed the frenzy. Uh, so. Uh, that, that's where it all went wrong. And that also, um, because right now we're also trying to assess Dr. Valens, uh, the, the healthiness of the banking sector uh, within uh, uh, the Eurozone. And there's uh, this commonly also reference, um, well, chart or a way of looking at it, which is obviously with a target two, mm -hmm. uh, to see basically the leverage depth based on every country in the Eurozone um, and basically the, the positioning of, uh, of course, like what you just talked about, having the more um, lending countries and the debt-taking mm -hmm. countries. Uh, up there you have Germany, uh, down there you have Italy, Spain, all the others. Um, how does that tell us um, anything about the current picture of the stability of the banking sector within the European uh Uh, region and in the euro well it, it is a bad omen because um, when when people uh, have liquidity and uh, rich italians as soon as they can they, they move to a german bank um, and that tells you something they don't trust their own banking system and it's, it's a political from a political point of view if you want to as as the netherlands for example if you want to be part of a banking union in which people that you marry and they don't trust their own banks, well, I would like to say that uh, that tells you enough. Mm. Interestingly, the um, the Dutch target two balance, it, it used to be positive. We used to be up there with Germany and Luxembourg. It, it is collapsing as well. It is halved, or more than halved. How come? Uh, I don't know, to be honest. If somebody knows, tell, uh, please tell me. What I do know is that... Uh, Most Dutch bank also have one uh, very big problem. And when they were saved during the last credit crisis, uh, all except for, for, uh, for Rabobank, uh, they're, they're, they're actually the same. What, what happened is that most uh, Dutch banks, they used to have a bank and an insurer. And if you want to have a mortgage, then the bank will say, okay, I will only give you a loan if you insure yourself all sorts of crazy uh, uh, things that might happen. Uh, life insurance and those those policies, those insurances were way too expensive. But the bank said, well, if you don't go to my insurer friend, you will not get a mortgage. Mm. You don't want to be homeless. If you're homeless, your wife will leave you. So sign at the dots. 
Um, and that is one way in, in which the Dutch people became over leveraged because they had to borrow money to pay for insurance pre- premiums against incidences that, that would never happen anyway. And the Dutch authorities, they noticed it. Um, so when the banks were saved, they were forced to split. So they were uh, removing the, um, the, the bank from the insurer. But what these banks and insurers did, they used the same uh, collateral, which is practically illegal. So if you're an insurer, you can start an insurance business tomorrow. You can also not do that. But if you do, um, you're writing premiums, um, you're holding people's cash for in case, well, fire breaks out, etc. You can imagine that an insurance company needs to have uh, uh, buffers. Um, however, a, ba- a bank needs to have the same buffers as well. And what these insurers, insurer bankers did when they merged, they wanted to be very capital efficient. Uh, so they used the same collateral for both the insurance company and the bank, which is illegal. Which collateral? Um, money. Simply money on the balance sheet. Mm-hmm. They needed to have a certain amount of uh, So they tap in money. the same pool, basically. So if yes. anything goes south in either both, the in insurance part or... Then the they're effed. Yes. Yeah. And for example, um, we, so had, we had. Sorry, how is that even possible if it's something that is actually practically illegal, as you said, that is actually circumvented? Because, well, my friend Hester Bice, she's a lawyer and uh, an accountant as well. She's writing a book about it. You should definitely in, uh, invite her. Mm-hmm. Um, and she explained all. She explained all this. So it, it was the same collateral uh, used for two businesses, which which is obviously illegal. If if you do that as a customer, so you say, okay, I want to mortgage my house. But you go to two banks to mortgage the same house, that's fraud. But the banks did, that any, did, did it anyway. Um, when it came out, they were all owned by the government. So the Dutch government wasn't too keen on yeah. punishing the shareholder, Fair which enough. it was the same government. But and it makes them extra vulnerable. It well. makes them more vulnerable, yes. And uh, it, it's, that might be one explanation. What you can also see is that, for example, you had uh, SNS Real, which was a, co- a combination of a bank and an insurer. Um, it went bankrupt. Bankrupt. Government had to save it, bill, bill out the combination. Then it was separated. Now you still have SNS Bank. They call themselves the People's Bank. Like it's all, it's almost uh, the communist the Chinese. Pa- yeah, part of it. <laughs> exactly. And they, they have all these nice commercials and they say, oh, we, we want to do green bonds and uh, we're so uh, and we're so woke and whatever. They have these horrible commercials, like they they are the some sort of social justice warriors. They're not. Uh, they're bankers and they want to make money. And that's okay. Um, but you do that on your own. What happened is that when they spun off the uh, insurer, the insurer was sold to a Chinese company for nothing. So you have a healthy company and you give it to somebody and it costs you nothing. The reason is, it, it is the same if somebody in France gives you an, uh, an expensive castle for one euro. It happens from time to time. If you have that, it, it, the, the entire castle will cost you one euro, but you will also have the obligation maintain to, to maintain it. Same here, right? And the same here. So when this, uh, when this insurer was sold to the Chinese company, the Chinese company couldn't, at least in the first year, draw dividends from, it, from that company because they had to recapitalize it. And the lack of that, recapit- it had to be recapitalized because there was a lack of capital. Mm-hmm. And that is gone mainly unnoticed in international media and Dutch media as well. It's mainly Hester Bais who has put a finger on it. Um, but that might be one reason why international investors, if they look at... Uh, th- there are certain banks that, uh, that, that's, that investors are shorting. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they also st- started doing that with, uh, with ABN AMRO and ING from 2017 on. And you see that their stock market value is collapsing. It's halving. People can simply uh, look what the stock quote of ING is, for example. And that, that is when this all started to materialize. And it has been mentioned in Parliament. Uh, questions have been asked, but it's, it's, it has not really been a, been a very big subject in the, in, in the Netherlands. Mm-hmm. You should, in, like I said, you should invest, uh, invest uh, invite Hester by. She yeah, will uh, we'll explain all of that. She's invited. Yes, <laughs> hereby. Um, very welcome. That uh, also leads to another point, because uh, we see through the um, pandemic and the use crisis that 
there's uh, already before, as you mentioned already, the 2019, you had already uh, shaky uh, levels of sovereign debt that also spilled over commercial banks and other yes. parties, non-financial institutions. Yes, re repo funds. market crisis. It's, it was it all there. And every, yeah. Everyone, right? That uh, right now, like um, I have like this huge uh, pile of 100 pages uh, of review of the financial stability review by the ECB. You actually um, print it. I printed it. I printed it. It's, it's not, not very. Uh, that's uh, not, not very friendly. Friendly. No. I'll, I'll actually no. It's like a Bible. I'll reuse it and I'll. A toilet paper. It. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. And they say um, page uh, eight. Oh, wow. um, <laughs> it's very. If, if, if you quote, you and, and, yeah. <laughs> if, if you quote, you want to look really intelligent. Exactly. You should yeah. learn it by heart. Well, as you can tell. No, from I'm, I'm not that intelligent, so I'm not. I'm not going to learn are. it by heart. Yeah. No, no. Uh, they say basically that there's vulnerabilities in the highly leveraged uh, um, corporate environments, corporate oh. bonds, um, and that the 19th percentile is increasing from 220% from end of 2019, so be before the pandemic hit, to over 270% in the final quarter of 2020, so not even a year, right? Um, and that spills off, of course, on um, insolvencies. That means yeah. that uh, you have a highly leveraged um, um, well economy because those yeah. corporates... Those enterprises hire people, have households, and that's how basically the whole cycle, I don't need to say to the listener or viewer, that's how the economy rolls. When Once that breaks, if let's say interest rates, the ECB starts uh, realizing that the inflation is getting out of out of hand. Yeah, uh, and, in, yeah in, and, in, and then, then all those uh, zombie companies need to refinance. Exactly. Then you'll see the big bang. The bonds as well, they yeah. are linked to that uh, interest rate, I can imagine. So it's getting more expensive to borrow and to actually... Fuel public deficit, right? Yes. It, it is on the short run, it is never tantalizing to uh, throw away this cookie. Yeah. So, so on the short run, so central banks internally, of course, they're talking about it. Economists, and you see, you can e even tell from uh, from the, the annual report of the uh, Dutch Central Bank. Of course, they notice it. I mean, it is the central bank that gave you this information. They there. know this. And in the short run, the only solution is give the patient more sugar, give him more sugar. But the patient dies at some point. The patient dies at some time. So, and uh, and you can al already see the signs of it. Um, and one one thing maybe that we haven't touched upon uh, last time, it is not just uh, the Dutch housing market that is exploding, and that, by the way, it's also happening in in, in, all, in other countries. But the the the, um, the original deficit countries, so the, the the countries that needed quantitative easing really bad. Um, and that, that's a problem of the European Union. You have different patients with different needs, but you all give them the same medicine because you have a political ideology that tells you that they're all the same. So that's that's why the ECB does the same in Greece as it does in Holland. But in, in both situations, it is uncalled for. What happens in Greece, um, the way they feel it, the way they are being hurt by this policy of, uh, of extension and muddling through and not really tackling the situation. A lot of people say that. Well, okay, yeah, um, European institutions, European Central Bank, um, they're muddling through. We all know that the Central Bank policy can't last forever, so at one point in time it will it will stop. But at least for now, um, you know, I'm, I'm sitting on a terrace, having a little bit of ni a, a, a nice wine, some pizza maybe. And, well, at least in the short run, everything is okay. Well, not really. If you look, for example, at the um, uh, the economic statistics in Southern Europe, they are really, really worrisome, and I I really don't understand why this is not a, uh, a topic. topic for debate. Yeah. Um, you have a number, and it is a uh, uh, statistical number once again, but this one is reliable, I think, uh, and it is your investment quota. So you can actually calculate what percentage of your economy is being reinvested in that same economy. So in high school economics, you have this, this equation that tells you what the size of the economy is. So Y, which is the economy, uh, equals consumption plus uh, government expenditures plus investments plus uh, the, the trade surplus or deficit that you have with the rest of the world. Just leave the trade surplus for now. And it's, uh, it's Keynesian econ economics, mm -hmm. so if, if, if there's a recession, people spend less, consumption goes down, government could spend more and correct it, uh, anti-cyclical behavior, etc. What I think is more interesting is the number I, investment. Because what you invest now will yield results in the, in the future. 
it is very obvious. If you have a restaurant uh, and it looks really crappy because they haven't been able to uh, to buy new f- furniture, get better staff, uh, uh, whatever, um, then then revenues will fall behind, and as a result, they can't make the investments uh, which are the, which are required to actually make it a success. So um, you get you get the spiral. That that's why the 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 predictive value of investments is very high. If in one year investments will drop, then in the next year you'll have a recession because um, businesses aren't able to um, to reinvent themselves, to, to invest in their capital stock or whatever, whatever their business is. So if you're a moving company, your van breaks down, you buy a new van, that's an investment. You hire somebody to drive the van, that guy has a, has a job, will consume, consumption goes up, you can tax the consumption, government can spend more, etc., etc. It all starts with investment, obviously. If you look at the... Um, uh, and a healthy economy has an investment quota of about 20%. But in Greece, in 2019, it was only 7%. And the highest level that they've ever had was, I believe, in the year 2000, and then it was 33%. So 33% of all the money they made were reinvested in the economy so they could make more money in the future. That's good. That's how you prevent unemployment. Right now, um, their investment level, and it has been like that for years, is half what it should be. So Greek businesses have ideas of what they want to do. Um, they put up investment plans, and they can only materialize half of it. So if, you, if you're a moving company and you have four vans, um, and you have to make reservations for, uh, for the retirement of four vans, so you, when they break down, you can get a new one. Um, Greek investments only allows for two two of those vans. So eventually, you'll end up with uh, with half the number of vans that you that you need, and then you will start firing some of the drivers. So when the when the level of investment goes down, uh, unemployment will follow mm. in, in the opposite direction. And it is very simple. People can uh, you go to Google, you go to Eurostat, for example, and you say, okay, what are the GDP components in Greece, but also in Italy? Only Germany is doing slightly better. Uh, they are sucking up some of the investments that were originally to be done in Greece and Italy and Spain. Um, but those countries are starving for uh, investments. And as a result, their youth unemployment uh, is above one third. In Greece, it is uh, 40%. But a lot of people don't, ever, don't believe that they will ever get a job anyway. So they don't apply for jobs anymore. But if you would, calcu- if you would add them up, which is reasonable... You have a youth unemployment for years in a row, which is 50%. Mm. That's generational unemployment. Generational un- unemployment. Um, so all these measures that have been taken to recapitalize banks and then uh, the quantitative easing part of the European Central Bank, uh, that has never really resulted in, in investments. And I've been warning for this for years. Uh, um, other, other people notice it as well. If you... If you just go to Google and you say, okay, uh, Greece, investment gap. Because there's investments lacking, there's a gap. Uh, PwC, an accounting firm, they, they made a report on it. And they say, well, yeah, that's, that's basically what happens. And it will have a terrible detrimental effect on, uh, on the health of the Greek economy. And that will damage the health of the people. People are more likely to, to become sick or depressed or commit suicide. Those numbers are very clear. And we, we look at it, we see it happening, and we completely ignore it. Then we say, oh, but wait a minute, yeah, it's troublesome for those poor Greeks, but my house is going up in, in, in value, I'm, I'm becoming richer and richer. No, you're not. It's a Ponzi scheme, because if you want to sell your house, there's nobody to sell it to. <laughs> that's, that's why you can see that um, the number of available houses in a certain class, it is, it is also dropping, because nobody is offering their house anymore because they can't finance a new one. And now only speculators, backed by money from the central bank, they are buying all those houses, um, giving out, uh, asking ridiculous uh, rents to immigrants that come to the Netherlands, like people from Greece or Poland or whatever, uh, and they're really sucking them dry. That's how you might might call it. So in, in, in all these countries, the youth and the working people, they are suffering. And these economies, they are not growing. These these numbers, they're horrible. Mm. Yeah. So so that's that's that. These are the ramifications 
of muddling through, not really dealing with the situation, asking, like we mentioned, Ed, we called it last time, the carpenter gorilla. So the, the central bank uh, doesn't have the right tools to solve a crisis like this. The institution that should be uh, solving this si situation doesn't exist. There's not a real European government. I don't think there, there should be one, but then you shouldn't have had a euro in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, all these difficult questions, these uh, existential questions, if you st if you simply ignore it, then things will escalate, and this is how it escalates. Housing prices in the Netherlands uh, are going through the roof, like you say. Um, you take away from people the prospect of owning a house uh, which you can finance with a decent job, and then you can start a family. And it's, it's often being called a social contract. Peter Omtzigt... Very good uh, politician. He calls it like that. There should be a relation between the state and the people. And if you be behave, if you're productive and you're nice and you're not too criminal, you work hard. Hey, you deserve a nice house uh, somewhere. You take that from people. And in Greece, you say, okay, I will take from you the opportunity to ever work. Hmm. Uh, so they're bo in both countries, the youth are suffering in different ways, but in an unsustainable way. So... Housing, for example, in the Netherlands, we have housing prices going through the roof. Uh, inflation is soaring, which you could say inflation. Which, which should be housing prices should be in inflation. Yes. Yes. It's uh, a one point nine percent. I think the la latest uh, May uh, numbers. So right, uh, flirting with the two percent um, mandate of the yeah. ECB. Yes, and economic growth is actually uh, well, sort of the same, maybe even slightly less than inflation. So in in effect, we have. Um, a decline in wealth so we see a declining economy we see the same or we see different um we see how this disease of well the the central bank or the european union uh, giving everybody the same drug um uh, giving everybody the same uh way of of trying to to uh, combat diseases yeah uh, is 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 having different effects in in Holland, housing in Greece, a super high under investment. Youth, yeah. Yes, youth unemployment, under investment. D what would do these the the people in the European Union? Do they know this? And if they do, why stick to the same program? Well, it's it's very painful, of course, to to um, admit and, and any sudden right. movements. Uh, Hurt so uh, muddling through is always the procrastination, as uh, Dambisa Moyo calls it. It is, it is always the preferred option in the short run. It is even if, if you're if you're in, if you're in school and you have a math exam uh, next week, well, you might just procrastinate for another day. For another day, um, in the short run, there are no winners. So if you deal with the situation, you take the pain. Everybody will suffer. In the medium term. And you've seen that in, uh, in the Scandinavian countries, early 90s, late 80s, they had a similar situation. Um, and they removed the bandage in one stroke, in one, uh, in one turn. They let a lot of banks fail. Um, they reorganized their banks. And then everybody knew that the pain was out of the system. So we've all, we've all bled. We've all uh, suffered. But now at least that we, don't, we know that there's no uh, ugly surprises. And I think that's um, that's what what you should go for in the long run. So actually take the pain, um, realize that it is unacceptable, and it's going to crash anyway. Um, li like I said, the <coughs> uh, banks are built for growth. Banks are unable to, uh, in, in in terms of accounting, to deal with declining housing prices. If housing prices were to decline. Which, which is good news for people who would actually want to buy a house, then uh, then the banks will um, suffer and they might fail because of it. Because that, that's that's one, one of the things that I always mention, that we are accounting for growth. Our accounting system is based on growth that, that does not exist. So what happens if you get a mortgage, uh, then then you have a certain loan-to-value ratio. Um, hey, you, you, um, it, it depends on your income. Maybe you have some savings. That the house you want to buy has a certain value. And then at that particular situation, the bank will look at the loan-to-value ratio. And depending on the loan-to-value ratio, loan to, uh, value of the house, they will give you a mortgage with a, with a certain uh, interest rate. 
um, and they put a mortgage in their books just before they sell it because banks sell mortgages, they still do that, and they make an internal valuation. And what and the, the whole thing, and the, the central bank will actually do some checks and say, okay, wait a minute, uh, you sold that guy a house of 100,000 euro, you gave him a loan of 100,000 euro, so loan-to-value ratio is 100%, you dealt with it correctly, so fine. The idea behind that is that this situation can only improve because everybody thinks that housing prices will always rise. So if you're healthy at this point in time, so you, you correctly calculated how you should treat a mortgage with a loan-to-value of 100%, then next year, if the housing prices have, let's say, doubled or gone up 10%, your loan-to-value ratio has, uh, has decreased because the house, the mortgage is still the same, a uh, little bit of redemption maybe, uh, but the housing prices have gone up. So all, all mortgages are automatically becoming safer and more stable. But what would happen, for example, if housing prices start to drop? Then your, your own mortgage that was declared a mortgage with a loan with a loan to value ratio of 100% starts becoming a mortgage with a loan to value ratio of 110%, 120%. At that moment in time, and it hap- can happen overnight, um, the bank will have to reclassify that loan internally. Um, and it is the Bank of International Settlements that, that determines those rules. So how, how do you apply risk with respect to a certain mortgage? And then you need to have more capital against the, the, the same mortgage. Um, We're touching upon Basel III. Yes. <laughs> I was yeah. just thinking about it. <laughs> yes. We, we can also not do that, but, but, well, that's, but, but, but if you think of it, in Basel, the Bank of International Settlements, they set rules for how to deal with crises. The net uh, stable uh, funding ratio. Exactly, and um, uh, and it, it is th- those those um, mechanisms have been built assuming eternal growth. But if you if you just if you have one year of declining housing prices, uh, you you will need to stack up more capital. You will need to sell shares, mm. and banking shares are still very low. They ve- they have valued very low by in- in- international investors because they know this. They've seen two thousand and eight. And they, they 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 all hired Michael Burry from uh, the movie The Big Short. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, all these people, they, they they say the same thing that, that I'm saying right here. Um, if housing prices drop, you need to have a um, reserve. And and, and, and the, the Dutch central bank has demanded from Dutch local banks that they keep more reserves mm-hmm. with respect to the mortgage portfolio. And it, is is that happening? They did. Um, it happened in 2019. In September, I recall, somebody who works there told me before that, so I knew it was going to happen. Uh, but nobody is talking about that because we have corona. So first of all, people have uh, other priorities, which I can somewhat understand. People uh, wonder, well, can I go on vacation or whatever? So they, they're not really um, very preoccupied with Basel III. <laughs> I <laughs> I can imagine that. And then there's been a lot of other financial measures that have been taken with corona as an excuse. And th- those measures have been able to ameliorate the situation for those banks. Uh, so that's that's why it's not really a, a topic. But if, if you look at it in the long run, um, it, it is a bubble. It is a credit-driven bubble. And all credit-driven bubbles will will eventually collapse. And then you will need a lot of equity as a bank to deal with that situation. And the central bank in the Netherlands is saying, well, you need to have more reserves for the moment, for the, for, for le moment supreme. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is also like, um, also talking about this, the environment, the current environment for banks is not very is not very good low. The interest rates are very low, mm-hmm. right? Uh, now we had recently, if you have hundred above 100K uh, in cash in uh, most uh, European banks, actually. Now in the yeah. Netherlands, it's taking effect in, uh, in the summer. 0.5 percent is uh, taken off, um, kind of defies of the purpose of the bank in the first place, um, because that the risk on top of that goes that if it goes past, well, you lose money in, in both ways. It's a lose lose situation, but also because then the buffer that they usually get from those interest rates is also lower because now they yes. can lend out to more people, right, with lower interest rates. But whereas in times where there has higher interest rate, they have higher paying loans. 
and they have more due diligence and basically better assessments of the people that take out the debt, right? Yeah. But now you dilute that. So yeah. any inflection and any, st- like in terms of domino effect, uh, the first, if the first domino starts falling, the, it's a matter of seconds until actually the hundred next uh, to that one is yes. also falling. So and, and the, yeah, and the central banks they've learned from two thousand and eight, and they 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 will make sure that they have programs to deal with this situation if if the s hits the fan as and they call it. They, they they're prepared for it. Yeah, prepared in theory or in practice because uh, also in practice. Okay. Yes. Okay. And, and in which way? Um, like I said, there, there's been a discussion uh, from around 2019 between central banks and governments mm-hmm. where they said, okay, the central bank is doing the government's work. A lot of, if I say that, a lot of people say, oh, that's conspiracy or whatever. But it's very, if, if you just, um, you can watch all the, the press statements made by Mario Draghi when he was uh, president of the uh, European Central Bank. He said, I'm not solving your crisis. I'm not solving your situation. I'm buying you time. And you can use the time Mm. When the sun, sh- sun shines, to fix the roof, but these politicians they didn't. What what did happen is that there was a f- very small fund, and it is the, the they call it the, the single resolution board or the single resolution fund. And then we say, okay, if one bank goes bankrupt, then the other should step in and help and, and uh, bill into that particular sick bank. But if they're all sick, and then uh, um, and they say, well, I, I see, said the blind to the deaf. If, they, if, if both banks are in trouble, they have two sick men who need, who need to help each other. And then they said, okay, well, if there's something, uh, if the situation escalates, um, then governments will eventually help uh, bail out the banks anyway. And we've always said in political discussions, well, fantastic, there's a single resolution fund uh, financed by banks. So all banks put um, half a percent of the de- of their deposits into a central European fund, in in seven or eight steps, seven steps. Uh, well, half a percent of of all your deposits in a real banking crisis that's not nearly enough to cover that. And then they say, well, in the theoretical solution uh, situation whereby um, this, this, the the single resolution fund is too small, then governments will pay pay for the for for the, for the deficit. So th- that's when they knew that eventually governments were needed to save the banks and build them out again. And it's all written in law. Yeah, but I mean, when you say save the bank, it's like signing the gringo to the ECB to basically print money and go basically uh, give out those loans and, and uh, basically c- recapitalize those, uh, yeah. those banks, right? Exactly, because if, if you do, because if you know that y- you'll suffer, eh? so the, the Dutch government is guaranteeing uh, banks in Italy so the Dutch government will never let them fall. Mm. So that, that's the whole problem with a guarantee. You can say, ah, oh, it's only a guarantee. No, if you've guaranteed uh, Unicredit, for example, as a Dutch government, you will prevent that bank from collapsing anyway. So you will d- do things beforehand. So you will recapitalize that bank before uh, it's, it, it will go bankrupt. Talking about... Uh, I, I just want to go back. First of all, I want to talk about uh, central bank digital currencies because it feels like the next step in trying to control something that is going to like the bubble you explained is going to collapse anyway but first i want to ask you people know this mm-hmm. so they you would say some of these policymakers know that we are on this inevitable route towards going back to, I don't know, a, a different currency, uh, maybe uh, integration, further integration. Yep. But why do we have all these problems? If people see the problems, why are they not addressed in a way that would, for example, keep the housing prices in the, in, uh, the Netherlands under control or make uh, keep, keep youth unemployment in Greece from being 50%? I've thought about it I'm thought about it I'm actually writing a book on this right now um, and I've, I've built my own model um, and it is an extended it, it is not mathematically speaking it's not that hard it's more um, sociology or psychology uh, let, let's let's have a situation um, um, let's suppose that we put a fence around this canal um, and uh, everybody that's in the fence within the fence 
we will redistribute their income. According, so it's it's simply rolling a dice because that, that's 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 a short run effect of any monetary policy. You're not really helping the economy. We we just discussed that. It's only redistribution. So housing prices go up because if you have if you're a bank and you've built very dangerous uh, financial products around um, uh, mortgages, then the central bank can actually buy these problematic uh, assets. The central bank can do that with Corona as an excuse. Um, so um, that doesn't really help help the economy. Uh, on, on the on the same token, you see that certain uh, uh, asset classes like sh- uh, stocks have gone up. I don't know if we've mentioned it before last time, but uh, Bernard Arnault, he's the richest man in Europe. He gained 150 billion euro in one year thanks to Corona. So he's uh, people always say, well, we all suffer from Corona. We have to get through this. No, that's not true. Uh, so you have a system that uh, that's suboptimal. The European Central Bank has to step up and do do certain things to save the day in the short run. Well, that will have a, uh, an effect on redistribution. Uh, some people suffer. Uh, some pe- some people don't. But in the long run, it is uh, very detrimental to society as a whole. Okay, now make it smaller. Um, we have the street. We're on the canal right now. It's the Herengracht, I believe. It is the Herengracht. Um, we put a fence around it, um, and everybody that walks in has to give away all their assets and their debts as well. Let's uh, assume that a lot of people have more assets than debts. I think in this region it's safe to say that it's, uh, uh, people are, are doing well in this uh, in this street, and we start redistributing them. Um, then s- then there are losers and there are winners. Okay, and then later on we will have a discussion on whether we would like to reverse that that move so it is literally literally like this you you go into the uh, um, you're found inside the square the fence square policeman will come to you and say i want to take all your assets and you give it to him and you do it with everybody else and then you make a lottery who it's gets a, it's what it's a racketeer it's a social racketeer it's a robin hood to say no that, that's uh, no, it's even worse it's more like stalin you take ev- everything from everybody. Um, after that, you will organize a lottery, and you will say, "Okay, you will get his assets." I know. I don't know which one of you is wealthier than the other, uh, but let, let's say you'll swap. You'll get his assets, and you uh, and, and the other way around, or from somebody you don't know. Do you think that it that is morally justified? No. Okay. Obvious answer. Um, then, then there's a lawyer. And the lawyer says, "This is not right. This is this is not morally justifiable. Um, let's start a class action suit against the government to undo this entire scheme, um, which is a, a big redis- redis- redistribution scheme with uh, with unhealthy effects on the long run. I don't think that people will actually back up that lawyer. I think they will let it happen." And that half of them are being stolen from. Why? Uh, because first of all, fifty percent have actually gained. It is a it is mm. a zero sum game. Printing money on the short run, it is always a, a zero sum game. So Bernard Arnault, the richest man in Europe, he went up from fifty billion to two hundred billion euro. Um, Jorge, so, some guy in Spain, who is a dishwasher. At a restaurant in uh, in Madrid, he notices that he can't get a, a house anytime soon. He's a loser, so you have losers, and you have winners. Well, the winners start to lobby, the losers start to lobby, and then you you would expect that fifty percent that's that's the economic outcome. Fifty percent will say, okay, this isn't right. Fifty um, percent is actually quite happy, but about fifty percent of the people in general isn't really interested in politics. Mm. Uh, if you go to a new, if you look at a newspaper, you see okay, what are the most the, the most popular articles? It is always about uh, pop stars, soccer, uh, sports, sports, etc. Entertainment. Somebody got divorced. Somebody cheated. That's what most people are interested in. So 50% of the people will not vote. So it's literally like this. We 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 build fences around the street. We call for somebody who looks like Stalin, and he expro- appropriates everything from everybody. He redistributes it, 
then 50% of the people don't care. Mm -hmm. 50% of the people that do care, of those 50%, 50% have actually gained. So they think they, they are on the winning side. So only 25% of the people are actually the losers who also believe that what happens is unjustified. But they are only three out of four. So if you want to do something about it, then only one in a democracy, yeah. only one out of four will actually back you up. Mm. So what I say right now is, uh, I can give you those numbers, and I, I have a an, an, an certain amount of fans, people that, that appreciate my work, but most people don't like me. Mm -hmm. Because those people, they, they, are, they think that they have been the winner. We have had one round of redistribution by Stalin. Who's Stalin? Uh, the Central Bank. It's, and that's maybe unfriendly. Um, I only want Stalin to be the redistributor here. It's for the sake not, of the story. Not, 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 uh, Let's say it this way. For the sake of the story. Yeah, for the sake of the story, somebody comes, redistributes, some, some people gain. And the people that gain and have gained will lobby. If one guy goes from 50 billion to 200 billion euro and he is good friends with all the French presidents, his lobbying will be much more powerful than Jorge, the dishwasher, in Madrid. Mm. So the outcome is that people in the short run uh, leave the situation as it is, and then you have a next round of redistribution. And then those wealth inequalities become bigger and bigger. Yeah. So it is fr from, a, from a game theory point of view, uh, we can imagine why people don't, uh, don't rebel. And also, also people that have just bought a house. Uh, they, they don't want to hear this. They, they know that they, they've been tricked. 